Hi, welcome. I'm Amy James. We are going to talk about blockchain content distribution here at San Diego Startup Week, thanks to our sponsors. Um, but before I get started, I was actually wondering about all of you. Who here owns Bitcoin? Has a Bitcoin wallet? Yeah? Okay, awesome. Who here feels relatively comfortable with the idea of Bitcoin and blockchain? You feel like you get it. Cool. Who here is a developer? Great. How about um, content creator? Okay. Awesome. Well, there's going to be something for all of you in my talk today. We're going to first talk about the technology that's making this format shift possible. And then I'll talk about the effects that it's going to have for artists and creators of all kinds. And then I'll get into the value, how, how the value moves through the system and the economics um, of the incentive structure. So our basic thesis is that we are in the midst of a generational format shift. I'm not talking about like an intra format shift moving from MP3 to FLAC. I'm talking about that format shift where we move from physical distribution to digital distribution. And this shift really started 20 years ago with Napster, right? But it, it hasn't been completed because there hasn't been a standard that was flexible enough for the whole industry to use. And so um, we're really at that moment in time right now where giant companies will fall and visionary companies will rise based on how they react to this technology. There's also this pattern that's happened in terms of content distribution over the years, you know, starting even back before, um, before recorded music, from moving from sheet music at Tin Pan Alley into recorded music, moving from going to the movie theater to watching on our sofas, Technology has driven all of these shifts, um, and the artists and the business side of being an artist has swung with these shifts. So what will happen is there's a reasonable size of artists who are able to make a living, and there's like a pretty good um, diversity in this group of artists, and then it will sort of centralize through the control channels until there's some big ones, and everybody else is kind of starving. And then, or, or there's too much control and they can't do what they want, and so there's a rebellion, and the technology is there to support it at the same time, and it kind of breaks open, and then there's this great outpouring of creativity, and we're really on the precipice of that right now. So, <clears throat> what's proven to us that we're on the precipice right, right now is how great the current services are. Anybody like Netflix, right? It's, re it's pretty great, right? But it also has some really serious problems that the problems in the current system the fractures are really starting to show to the point now where both artists and audiences are unhappy and what's interesting is we see these same patterns when we look at the history of the web itself so before the web really the internet we had aol prodigy compuserve this walled garden proprietary stacks where if I was an AOL user and you were a CompuServe user, we couldn't communicate. And it was AOL that came along and gave us the open web that we all have such fond memories about, right? But now we're in web 2.0, as some people call it. And it's like these bell jars have descended down over us <laughs> and closed up all those indexes for how we're going to access content. And we're in a walled garden system again. And this is that problem that I'm talking about. This is this is where all of those issues are happening, all of those points of control. Oh, and I did want to point out here that um, even though it feels like crazy that we're still in the middle of shifting from physical distribution to digital distribution, because like who buys physical music or movies anymore? The actual business of these, when you look at their revenue streams, at least 50% in some cases are still coming from physical sales. And so there's like evidence that we're still in that shift and the reason that the business has struggled to make that shift is, again, because the technology hasn't been there. So content creators in the room or, or fans of content, have you, have you struggled in the system at all? Have you been deplatformed, demonetized? Has something that you wanted to watch been censored or taken off of a platform? A few heads are nodding. Yeah. We're seeing this 
everywhere. Some of the biggest content creators on YouTube and in music and even platforms are all speaking out about these problems now. And the really good news here is that because of blockchain and other decentralized technology, this, this shift that I'm talking about means that artists can make a real living. So in this simulation, comparing it to Apple Music and Spotify, artists will make seven to eight times what they're currently making, and audiences will pay 50% less, consuming the same amount of content. So how does it all work? Our, our project is named as an homage to the ancient library of Alexandria because it's the perfect um, example of the problem with central points of failure, right? It's like tragic. And this is the current shape of the web today. It's this hub and spoke system. It's not decentralized. And it's at these hubs where the control happens. It's where when we're trying to watch something that's really popular and the system is overwhelmed, it slows it down and we have buffering. It's where censorship or deplatforming can happen. And this is where we're headed. We're headed to a, a fully decentralized system. This is like the dream that the blockchain and decentralized people are all talking about today. This is what the kind of architecture of that system looks like where everyone is connected. And so it doesn't matter if you take out a single node on the system, you can still access the content. And so while a lot of us are really buzzy about blockchain in particular, there's a lot of decentralized ways to do things. And this is really comparing the current system that we were just looking at, this one, to a decentralized system, this one. And what it shows you is that in the current system, popularity has a negative correlation with speed and quality. And in a peer-to-peer -peer system, popularity has a positive correlation with speed and quality. So the more popular something becomes, the better it is for you, the faster that you're getting it, right? And it also has tremendous efficiency. So think about the current system, right? Network Netflix is running its own CDN. So it has those um, hubs and spokes everywhere. So is iTunes, so is YouTube. There's so much redundancy, they're all hosting the same content. In a peer-to-peer -peer system, you only need a few seeds to be sharing that content, and you can have fantastic quality. So what we've built, our team, is something that's called Open Index Protocol. And what it is, is a fully decentralized and permissionless system that anchors data into a blockchain. So you want to think about that anchor like the card catalog in a library. So I'm going to just walk you through good old Alice and Bob here about how the system works. So here's Alice. She's an artist. And um, I'm going to show you. So you can run the system in a fully decentralized way, and that's actually sort of simpler to explain. But because we think most people will access it through a web-hosted client, I'm going to show you that version here. So Alice is going to be interfacing with a platform that we've called Ustreamify <laughs> for this example. And she is going to send her content to Ustreamify, who's running an open index protocol daemon. And when she does, she's gonna send she's gonna send the files for her artifacts, so whatever that may be, whether it's an album, a video, what have you. She's also gonna fill out just like her basic publisher information, her name, the title of her materials, any descriptive information, her her tags, these kinds of things but she's also going to set her own terms and her own pricing. And so her terms of use could be like how another artist could use that in an iterative way and pay her a portion of it. Um, she's gonna be able to set her own pricing and I want you to think about now the unserved market, right? Between, so YouTube will pay creators about a hundredth of a penny per view for an ad monetized view. And iTunes pays like 70 cents, you know, when you sell something for a dollar. So there's this, this unserved market of content that's worth more than a hundredth of a view, but less than 70 cents. And there's tremendous opportunity for, for artists to capitalize in that area. Um, so she sets her pricing and she also, um, and so she has all of this metadata that she's putting together. And <coughs> the daemon first sends it to IPFS. Who knows what IPFS is? Oh, just a few of you. Okay, so IPFS is sort of, uh, similar to BitTorrent in that it's a peer-to-peer -peer distribution network, 
Um, but what's really special about it is that it's content addressed. So as long as you have the hash, you can locate that content in the network. So we send the, the content to IPFS to get a hash. The hash comes back. And then the daemon bundles the whole thing and sends it to the flow blockchain here, where that is put into the flow blockchain. And this is, like I said, the card catalog. And then that's going to propagate across the system. And then Bob over here, Alice's biggest fan, he's viewing his, uh, his feed on Facetube. And uh, Alice's content pops up. He's like, heck yeah, I want to watch this. And so first, what we saw there was that the Florin coin, these little lines are kind of hard to see probably from the back, but this little line, the Florin coin, um, his metadata in the Florin coin blockchain was recognized by the Flow daemon which served it up to the platform. So that's how he saw it in his feed. And then when he clicked play on it, the IPFS network serves that file up to him. And then he was like, hey, Alice, that was a really, that was a really great video. I really liked it. And so he wants to send her a tip so that she'll keep making content. So then he sends her a tip in Bitcoin. So the fully decentralized version of that would basically be that Alice is running <laughs> at this level, and so is Bob. Right? It would just take out that platform layer at the top. So now I'm going to talk about um, the, the sort of business side of things and the impact that this is going to have for artists and creators. And this is my favorite part because it's really exciting. So right now, to be a creator in the system, I have to have an independent relationship with every um, distribution channel I work with. I have to surrender control of my content to them, and I have to let them dictate to me my terms of use and my pricing. In the new model, I'm going to publish a single copy, just like Alice, of my content. And any front-end service, it could be a major front-end service, it could be you on your private blog, it could be a friend of yours in a social media channel, can display and sell it according to my terms of use. And if any of those places that it's being displayed results in a sale, I get paid directly. So what this means <laughs> is that there are all kinds of new ways that I can monetize my content. So um, I can monetize it by um, displaying it in a social media channel, like I said, for a micropayment. I um, can do this iterative pricing. This is so, so cool when you think about the internet, right? So, um, so let's say that I have just like all of this footage that I shot that I didn't end up using in my movie, but there's a ton of it and it's cool. And maybe somebody could use it for something else. I can put it all out there in the world and I can declare my terms of use such that the editor will get paid and I'll get paid when whatever they make gets published and or gets consumed, right? Like all of those splits that happen will happen completely in the background handled by the system automatically. So it's going to reduce my administrative burden dramatically, um, but it's also going to really open up creativity so that creators can use one another's work um, and give them what's most important, which is credit and money. Um, so I've talked about how it can be used for content distribution, um, but the overall system of Open Index Protocol can be used in a whole bunch of different ways. We've been working with Caltech um, on an electron tomography database, and they have released now over 10,000 data sets of high resolution electron tomography um, photographs, essentially, which are like high resolution photographs of cells. Um, and the reason that they decided to do it with Open Index Protocol was to, to show this new way of sharing academic data. Because one of the problems in academic data sharing is essentially entropy. Grant money runs out, servers get turned off, or the data sets are so large, they're hard to share, hard to host, these kinds of things. Um, but this system was able to handle it really easily and handle it in a public and decentralized way, but also respect the lab's terms of use, right? That's the same thing with the creator's terms of use that we were talking about before. And so other labs can now come along and contribute to this data set that maybe have different terms of use, 
but they can still have their data be formatted in the same way so that it could be, mul it could be used by different applications. Um, the other way that it can be used um, is a, actually this is a San Diego company here. Uh, Robo3D is experimenting with distributing um, 3D printables with blockchain. And so this would be um, like to print a, a toy for yourself at home, that kind of thing. And this one's a little bit tricky because of the kind of licensing, but we're able to kind of work all of that stuff out inside of this system as well. Um, and then we are best known as Alexandria. The project when it got started four years ago, was the whole thing was called the Decentralized Library of Alexandria, just to kind of capture what it is we were after. Um, and as the project has matured, we've uh, changed it to make it more clear so that we named the protocol, Open Index Protocol, that spec um, for how everything is standardized. And then our company is called Alexandria, and this is the browser. So anything that's published correctly to Open Index Protocol will show up in the Alexandria browser. Whereas when we're looking at the Caltech ETDB browser, they were only displaying electron tomography data, even though it was published alongside the music data that's all inside Open Index Protocol. Does that make sense? Yes, no? <laughs> okay, so, um, so yeah, so Alexandria is like the search all. It's where you can find everything, whether that's music, movies, books, scientific data, 3D printables. So now we're gonna talk about what is arguably the most interesting and important part of this, which is the way that blockchain changes the economic incentive structures of these systems. So Joel Monegro, who was an analyst at Union Square Ventures at the time, wrote an article that really became Im really important in the blockchain community to talk about how value moves through these systems. And um, he called it fat protocols. And so what he was meaning by this is that the previous generation of protocols, HTTP, um, TCPIP, there was no value transmission at the protocol layer and no opportunity for value capture. And so all of the opportunity for value happened at what he called the application layer. And this is why you see these closed walled gardens that we're talking about that are the problem. With a blockchain, he, he called them fat protocols because at the time, you know, well still, but, <laughs> um, all of the money going, or the majority of the money going through the system was at the protocol layer, right? The comparison of like the market cap of Bitcoin to Coinbase or something like that. Like there is so, such a small amount of value available at the application layer to be captured because most of whatever the use case is, is happening at the protocol layer with, with blockchain um, protocols. And so he called these fat protocols and suggested that the most that the better investment was at the protocol layer um, but what we've now seen kind of evolve in these last couple of years since he wrote the article is that we're seeing a re um, a repeat of the walled garden problem right because if you launch a protocol for a specific use case and you build an application but nobody else has incentive to build an application with that protocol then it's just another walled garden and if you have to use that token to work with that application, it's just another walled garden. And so we're sort of seeing these problems um, that are happening in the FAT protocol design in terms of the stability long-term of these networks. And so we are introducing actually this idea of a salutary protocol. And this is just another uh, model for how a system can be designed. Lightning Network is also would meet the the criteria of a <laughs> of a salutary protocol, um, because the criteria of a salutary protocol is that there is a requirement that the protocol send value to the application layer. So the way that that happens in the Lightning Network is the channel operators. The way that that happens in Open Index Protocol is at the platform an influencer level. So this is when I was saying earlier how I can, as the artist, can publish a single version of my content and anybody can display and sell it on my behalf. Those people are incentivized to do that work by this split. So when I register my content and I say that 10% goes 
to the platform that sells it for me, and 10% goes to the influencer that shares it, that, that shares it and that results in that sale, then that's how that happens. And that's that money that's being sent by the protocol to the application layer. So that there's now um, competition at the application layer for apps to deliver a quality experience. And so what this protocol application layer split does in the salutary model is it, it divides the work that should happen at the protocol layer into objective work and the work that should happen at the application layer into subjective work. So think about it. At the, at the, I mean, sorry, at the protocol layer in a salutary model, it's doing all the objective work. All of the things that will become essentially commodities like uh, file storage, um, distribution, file distribution, mining uh, to secure the blockchain, those kinds of things, fungible commodities that are, that are objectively measured. And things at the application layer are subjective. So these are things like the quality of the user experience, um, the quality of the discovery and curation, or the filtering lists. And, and this is what's really exciting about this change that we're gonna see. Because right now, distribution companies are competing for our business based on what's in their indexes, right? Which artists do they have? Or which movies do they have? Instead of competing for our business based on the quality of the experience that they're offering us. And so this is how this kind of gets shifted on its head. And it's also how the system can function so that everybody inside of the system is in a in a co-op co-opetitive co-opetition <laughs> there's a co-opetition spirit of co-opetition um, <laughs> because it's it's aligned where it's working together but there's still competition to improve the overall experience so um, these are the various ways that any of you could participate in this system right you could be a miner of the florin coin blockchain which is the anchor of the metadata you could contribute to the file storage and distribution by participating in IPFS. You could share content that's been published to OIP on your social media channels, and this works just like an Amazon affiliate program where if those result in sales, you get whatever cut is due to you. Or you could host a whole platform. And to host a platform, you have to do certain things, run nodes and things like this, um, but it's, it's pretty easy to do. We have a whole um, wiki about this if you are very technically minded and looking to get started. Um, so I just wanted to direct you to that. That's going to be at oip.wiki. And if you are a creator who wants to get started early, you can email our team at creator at alexandria.io and we'll give you early access and some handholding for how to publish inside of our system. And I welcome your questions.